the nature of uh, the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there is no dichotomy between what's known as the inward and the outward, the form and the, the, the meaning. So that which we do, that which manifests, that which you can see and touch and is tactile, uh, emanates forth from, a, from a, a spiritual and unseen place, a reality as they'd call it, a haqiqa. And similarly, that which we do outwardly impacts that place. And there are a multitude of different degrees to that place. So um, one of the ways to monitor one's spiritual state is to look where you're at outwardly. What am I speaking about? How do I speak? What am I listening to? What am I looking at? What am I feeling? All of these things are uh, indicators uh, to something much deeper. And the, the people who had an expertise, the masters within this field, were often referred to uh, endearing this atibba al qulub which is literally doctors of the heart. And one of the reasons for this is because there are many uh, um, commonalities between uh, medicine, medical science, and the science of spiritual purification. So there, you know, there are often, uh, you know, it involves a diagnosis. It evo involves the a capacity to recognize certain symptoms uh, and also, and therefore, a prescription to evoke a remedy. Now, up until now, we've been speaking primarily about uh, how to transition uh, from different spaces, from one place to the other. So, going into our homes, going, when we wake up in the morning, when we go into the evening. And all of these things should start to help the heart and the soul to be in a, in a place where it is um, in, a, in a consistent place of being conditioned when you wake up in the morning. And anyone that's started to put this into practice over the last few weeks, last week or so, they'll start to find a difference. They'll feel a difference, just that active um, compelling the heart to say Alhamdulillah, it will have a huge difference in one's, in one's state. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi came to uh, teach us, but in order to, to teach us how to truly connect, there has to be a, a detox and there has to be um, a recalibrating and there has to be a process where we're brought back to a, a state of health in order to receive certain messages, certain understandings. And the Qur'an uh, mentions this where it says, Wa yuzakihim, And he purifies them. And he's purifying them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Purifying a person from distraction, purifying a person from uh, hemorrhaging in their focus, in a, having an inability to, to, con to concentrate and focus, uh, purifying them ultimately from anything other than complete devotion to Allah. I mean, that's the... That's the the accolade, that's the pinnacle of uh, Islamic spirituality. And that's the essence of ikhlas. That you dishevel and uh, divest oneself of any other hemorrhaging uh, uh, inclination or intention. So it becomes purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of these practices will help in that process. The more a person cultivates intentionality, why are we doing this? Bismillah, in the name of Allah then the more that reconciled a person will be and directed they'll be to that goal. The more a person practices uh, gratitude and places gratitude in its right place, Alhamdulillah, after we do something, the more a person goes into a state of recognition. And this starts to uh, help a person upon their, upon their spiritual journey. Now, that's not where it ends. Because throughout the day, there are going to be moments where we're not waking up, when we're not going to sleep, where we're not going into the car, when we're not doing those kind of practical, seemingly trivial things. There are other things which affect our state, that affect our soul, and these can often be through engagement with other people. So how do we engage with other people? Today, specifically, we're going to be talking about certain remedies in diagnosing the state of the heart. How do we remedy the heart from uh, states of ill health, 
or states which can be toxic and states which need to be purified in order for a person to be on a sound spiritual path, in order not only to be uh, fortified, but also to be receiving from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much of this is related to uh, the nature of the self. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمْرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Allah takes an oath and scans through the, these magnificent uh, components of his creation وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا by the sun and its emergence into the day and its dawning وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ وَالْقَمْرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا and by the moon and by, so by the sun and then Allah swearing by these things taking an oath I swear by this I swear by that I, you know وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقَوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَاهَا By the nafs, by the ego, by the human self, Allah swears by it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَاهَا So all of this is like a prelude leading up to this epic reality within this surah. I'm swearing by these these things which are magnificent parts of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا He has succeeded. أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Succeeded. The one that has zakah has gone into this process of tazkiyah. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَاهَا And he has destroyed, ruined himself. Mandasaha, the one that soiled it, dirtied it, ruined it, neglected it. So the the nafs and the nature of the nafs, if it's purified, it starts to be able to receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's neglected, by by default it becomes soiled, it becomes dirtied. And we, we start to be, have this you talk about being, I feel cloudy headed. This makes me cloud cloudy, my head feels cloudy. But the heart also has clouds. And, if, and what, what happens when the heart and the soul becomes cloudy, then it, 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 it narrows that ability to perceive. It clouds that capacity to uh, be in a state of, of active basira, where you're perceiving things, and you're perceiving meaning. Now what happens with that is that you, uh, it changes the way you view the world. And it affects what you see on the soul. So you can be living the same existence, going to the same day. But why do you feel a different feeling in different days? Why when you go to work one day, it feels different to another day? And often our diagnosis is very superficial. It's only at the very scanning, the top of our, you know, very superficial level of our being. I just had a late night last night. Maybe that's a part to do, no doubt. I just, you know... You know, someone spoke to me the wrong way and I've just been frustrated ever since. Maybe that's a part to it. But what the, what the Islamic tradition does here is it goes right because of the, the, the importance of taking care of the nafs. And that true success in this life and the next is based and rooted upon it, upon purifying it, upon cultivating it. And eternal loss, yataratib, is based and founded in just neglecting it. The scholars played, played a particular import, uh, importance to this. So what we need to do is go into a regular, uh, develop a practice of a, like a regular checkup of the self. Self-checkup. How do you self-diagnose? You know? Because if you don't, then you're going to be self-harming, harming the nafs. And what that can lead to is a whole host of other different Diseases of the soul. Just mere neglect of the soul in, inherently is indicative of a disease. 
Because when you leave something that is meant to be flowing, it's like a stream, it starts to become putrid, it starts to fester, and it starts to other creatures crawl in that you don't, it's like a swamp. So the soul needs to be tended to. It cannot be neglected. And we need to go through a daily practice of just weeding out some of these things. Now, we just wanted to reflect on a few examples of this. And then we can, inshallah, start to base uh, and construct a daily practice for, um, for weeding out what's in the soul. So, the scholars talk about uh, the muhlikat. The muhlikat from the word halak, that which literally ruins you. Uh, you could translate maybe in a, in, a, in a nicer way into the English language as vices. But muhlikat is literally that which will lead you to destruction. It's those, those traits within the self and within the soul that if they're not tended to, if they're not weeded out and they're not remedied, you know, and something else isn't rooted in its place, then it leads to a person's disruption, disrupt, uh, destruction. Yeah. So, if you look at the primary, like the cardinal sins, the real problems within the soul. The scholars had a difference of opinion, but primarily they're re related within the same category. So things like pride, conceit, arrogance, often these things are related. What is conceit? Conceit in the Arabic language is ujub, often translated as ostentation. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite an interesting word. Like, I don't think Typically, people will use the word ostentation. You, you seem like an ostentatious person, you know? you know. Normally, they'll use the word vain, like you're so vain, you know. So vanity is, uh, is one of the primary diseases of the heart. Now, where does that come into arrogance? It's important that we understand these definitions so we can self-check so we can check up where are we at do i have anything of this how do i screen myself and then how do i prescribe you know engage in a methodology which allows me to now you know be purified of those things and bearing in mind that we're all susceptible it's not like i don't have those things that's the sign that you've not really you know looked deep into what's going on in that garden what's going on in that, in that you know that flower bed there's some weeds creeping up under what you seem to look like flowers and Beautiful leaves, but what's going on there? They need taken up because they'll suffocate the entire space without you knowing. Yeah. So, and just to keep it very real, sometimes these things can seem really heavy. Because this is the real bit where you look into the mirror. You know? And this is why the nefs even starts, we've got to be really, because the nefs will try and find any way it can to squeeze itself out of looking in the mirror. And what's to do with the mirror of the heart, then even more so. So I'll just do my, you know, alhamdulillah in the morning and astaghfirullah in the night and that, that's good for me. But if we want to get really practical, really analyze the nafs and really transformative in our uh, journey, in our saluk, in our wayfaring, in our spirituality, we have to really take it on. And this is why this practice uh, requires courage. You know, really requires courage because it's to do with self-restraint. You've got to restrain the nafs, restrain, pin it down and start to analyze it for what it is. They say shadid bi the the shadid, a person of real strength, is not the one that's able to just wrestle and fight. You can win someone in a fight. Well, like in a shadid, man yamlik nafsahu in dal ghadab. Rather, a person that's really strong, a sign of true inner strength, true strength, is a person that's able to be self restrained. They're able to yamlik nafsahu, literally hold on to his nafs when triggered, when angered. Now, sometimes we don't know, what, what do you mean? Hold on to what? I can't grab onto it, I can't see it. It's unquantifiable. That's why and sometimes, because of the mystical element of the nafs, it can be very challenging to hone into. So it takes practice. It takes developing habits which, ah, now that's out of line. That's a weed, that's not a flower. I get it, it takes, and the more we deepen our knowledge in this, the, you know, the, the, the more insightful we'll become. We'll become. No. So conceit you know, or, or vanity, how does that differ from arrogance? Arrogance requires other people. Conceit 
you can you can go solo. So a person may not be necessarily arrogant towards other people, you know. But when they're alone, they know they're the man. You know you're the man. You know. You're the boss. You're doing this. And it may all just need to require a mirror. It may just need a quick, you know, look in the selfie mode on the phone. And how many things, you know, all these technologies are not neutral technologies. How many things subliminal, you know, uh, in how many of these things are slowly, you know, polluting our inward? They're cultivating. We're, we're being conditioned. You're letting, you know. These things have been con conditioning our souls. You look at it in a selfie mode. I'm just going to check, like, you know, look presentable. But then it's like, yeah, maybe take a picture. Maybe do. Some people, they fall into this. Even if you save the pictures for yourself, you never get them out. That's the nature of vanity and conceit. That you see yourself as something amazing. Now, one could say, well, we are amazing. And, you know, human beings are an amazing Species, we're, what do you mean? We're not amazing. Look, we can, look at this culture, look at what we can write, look what we can achieve, look, look at we, what we can build, look what we can, you know. But it's thinking you're amazing and attributing it to your own self. I'm amazing because I deserve this, because I did, look what I built, look what I did. Look, and it's not putting things in its rightful place. You know. So to recognize Something, if there's something good in yourself, it's only a gift. It's something you've been given. And it's putting it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And knowing, therefore, it can be taken away at any moment. And that's why we're not arrogant towards other people. Because you know? if you start feeling like you're praising yourself, you're worshipping yourself. Yeah, I'm, I look good. Oh yeah, that's, that sounded awesome. Yeah, you know. It's not saying, subhanAllah, Allah, that... That was a gift that I don't deserve. You know? But it's, it's a means of, of linking that thread you know, of a particular gift back to its rightful place. Ujjab is like you're just a blockage. You know? You're a block in, in the spiritual system. You, you, got, you got yourself in the way. You know? Alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah. It's reality it goes back to Allah. Not to you. You know? So ujab literally is to think you're a jeep. It's from the same word. You're a jeep. I'm a jeep. You know the Arabs say a jeep when they're amazed with something. A jeep. You know, I'm looking pretty a jeep. And the Prophet wasalam, said that one of the signs of the end times is every person is like really impressed with with their own opinion. It's from the signs of the end. Yajib from the same word. You know. Every person of opinion is a means with their own opinion. And it's an opinion, it's a ru'ya, it's, it's one view, vantage point of something. It's not necessarily that it's true. And the believer should always be in a state where they're cultivating a, a place of truth. You know, we want to be with what's real. Not, what, not with just I think or what I perceive. Because maybe that perception may be accurate, but maybe it's 80% accurate. Let me be careful what I say and let me be careful. Often we, we say things and speak as if they're like, you know, universal truths. And it, it's not, it's an assumption. It's a, it, there's a, there are, you know, sprinkles of conjecture in it. You know? And in order to become people of truth, we need to cultivate how we're projecting truth, how we're um, allowing truth to penetrate us, what we speak and what we listen to, what we see. Now, some people could, could say, because there's a whole load of, you know, trends about like, you know, you are amazing. And like, you are this, uh, you know, telling people that they're good at everything. You know, but this is far more damaging. You know, and it's not empowering. Because if you've already achieved everything, then how do you aspire to anything? You're already the best. You're the best. You've got the best voice. You've got the best. You should really like, you know, you, you should be famous. You know, it's just like saying, let me just inject all of these spiritual diseases onto you. Like, no, thank you. Like, the believer should be like, a'udhu billah. Like, I see the source of where that's coming. No, thank you. You know. Now, there are different symptoms we've got to always check every time during the day. 
when you look in the mirror, and here's the practical advice, when you look in the mirror, which is a sunnah, that's the first thing that we do, you look in the mirror with the intention of sunnah. You know. And the Prophet wouldn't spend a whole hour in the mirror. You know. And he would have intentions to, to beautify himself for the sake of Allah, and to beautify himself for the sake of his brothers, but to call people back to Allah. Not just so people would be like, you're looking pretty slick today, like, what's, what did you do with your beard, bro? What did you do with your, you know, you got some like, you know, all these kind of things. Subhanallah. You know, one of the signs of that are people going out awaiting compliments. You know, and you just rooted all the, all the, all the vanity of what's alone in the bathroom, wherever it is, you know. La hawla la quwwata la billah. So when you look in the mirror, know that these are entry points for the shaitan. You know, it's a possible trigger. And how to nip that in the bud is you, before you look, you make an intention for the intention of the sunnah. Yeah. And you put things right, whatever you need to do. And then you make the dua that we can send out. Allahumma kama hasanta khanqi fa hasin khunqi. Because it roots you in what's real. Oh Allah, as, as you have beautified my outward form, Beautify also my character. You know. Because that's what it's really at. In Allah la yandur ila surikum. Allah is not really bothered about your outward form. There are many people which outwardly may not look that good, but they're dear to Allah. That's what Allah is interested in. Yeah. And even in your outward form, it's only in that which is connected to what's real, to a reality. Indeed, Allah does not look to your outward form, how he looks to your hearts. So connect even the outward practice to something which is real. Looking in the mirror can be a, an opportunity to you know, increase in vanity or it could be an opportunity to increase in consciousness and putting things in its right place. You know. Now Allah, as you've beautified my outward form, beautify my character. And unfortunately, how many times when you get these kind of like, like in celebrity culture, people that may, wallahu alam, are, are deemed beautiful, but have the foulest of characters. You know, people that are arrogant, conceited, rude, derogatory towards other people, God's gift to mankind. Billah. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ came with. And nobody was more good looking than him. Nobody was more literally attractive. You know, people would be compelled by his beauty, ﷺ, but the most humble of people. That's perfection, that's completion. You know, putting things in its rightful place. Typically, the diseases of the heart come about when there's an imbalance. لا إفرات ولا تفريد Don't go to either extremes. Excess or complete negligence. The sun, sun is the balance, the middle way. And typically, once again, to know that the nafs uh, loves to be polarized. It inclines to, to, towards polarization. And that's why the middle way is not the average way or the moderate way or the kind of half-half way. That's the center point. That's the essential balance. So when we talk about the middle way, it doesn't mean, yeah, we're kind of just a moderate ummah, average ummah. Wasata, it means that the, the, the most perfectly placed, the center of the balance, the, 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 the most central, uh, and for that reason, afdal, you know, the, the greatest of ways. You know. So everything that we do, we've got to judge our, our nafs, and the, the, the exa- exemplary of that is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So that's ujjah, about the way, inshallah, taken care of. You know, we've got to be careful of all of these kind of things. Nip it in the bud. If you find yourself just staring at your, into your own eyes in the mirror, you know, just whoa, no, just like do one of those checks on yourself. And whatever it may be, you know, because another, another example of this, ujub, because you can do it when you're in front of people. Imam Ghazali gives an example that, you know, if you are... In a, in a, there's a group of people that are gathered together And all the important people, as you perceive it, are sat at the front Now, one example of someone thinking that there's something special It's related to arrogance also Is they just go and sit and sit in the middle of the, of the, of, you know, at the front of the, the meeting It's like going to a boardroom in a contemporary example Just sitting down where the boss normally sits, where the director normally sits Like, who are you? That's not your place, know your lane Just be humble And spiritually the reason why these things, analogies have to be given is because typically in, in, in our contemporary societies we don't have this understanding, we, just, you don't, we don't know where to sit and anybody that's experienced a, a, a traditional 
faith rooted society rooted in faith is they know exactly where to sit. And it seems like an obvious thing, but it's a subtle thing. And it makes a lot of difference to the flow and the nature of the, the barak and the blessing within a gathering. So that's kind of an obvious one. But he says, if you really want to test for the urjab, you know, is that you sit at the back. But in your heart, you'll know like, you know, so humble because really I should be the guy sat up front, you know. And that's when the shaitan is like, yeah, I got you. I got you. You thought, you thought it's at the back, but you're thinking like, if only they knew my heart. If only they knew my place with Allah. If only they knew the spiritual gifts that I've been given. You know, but I'll be humble. They don't know. I'm veiled clearly. Most of the awliya are the hidden. A'udhu billahi min shaitanir rajeem. May Allah save us from ourselves. Like save our souls. I mean, from our soul, from ourselves. You know, Subhanallah. Now these things can be heavy, because to to many of us, like that's me. You're asking me to give up me. Who am I then? What am I then? If if not that, I am the guy that sits there, and I am the like no. What the Sunnah is calling you is the real you, the true self. The self which has the potential to know Allah, you know. The self that when purified can, can be, when we talk about success, falah, you know, we're talking about ma'rifa, that the soul is now so ready to receive, because it's gotten over itself. Like, get over yourself, that's the nature of the ujab. Yeah. And Allah give us tawfiq. So arrogance is in the same kind of category. You know, arrogance is where you, you need other people. You look down upon other people. Ihtiqar al khalq. You just start to like look down upon on other people. To s- basically that you are better than someone else. You know. And normally these are for erroneous and misguided assumptions. Now, the imam, the leader, the master of this particular way, you know, also used the same methodology. Well, you created him from clay and you created me from fire. Like, I'm, I'm made from fire and you created him from just like clay. You know, so therefore, it's like, okay, yeah, shaitan, where are you going with that? So therefore, uh, well, erroneous equation. So what? So what what you were made from? You know, false logic. You know, my, in, talking to my rationale, my perception is this is better than that. Well, that's not the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it. Sayyidina Adam was greater than, than Iblis. Yeah. And he couldn't contend with it. He couldn't deal with that. And he couldn't deal with it. Now, arrogance could be that you may have a blessing that someone else does not have. But once again, it's this, this idea of not being able to appropriate it properly. To think that you've deserved it. I worked hard for this. I deserve this because this is what I've worked hard. You may have worked hard. Who gave the ability to work hard? If you were crippled and in a coma, would you be able to do the same thing? Okay, who prevented you from that? You. And all those times when you were working hard, you know, you're, you're inhaling and exhaling. How many breaths did you breathe? Was it a loss of to to cause the oxygen just to go? That was from you. You caused the oxygen to, to be there. Everything which was going on, which could have gone wrong inside of you. Who was that from? You. You're in charge of your heart and your organ, your organs, your pancreas, your liver, your stomach, your intestine, your lungs. You were kind of monitoring that whilst you were, you know, getting up there. Nope. It's all from Allah. Even that uh, inspiration, even that tawfiq. Because how many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up a doorway for some people and doesn't for others. And it's not necessarily that they're better or more deserving. Hikmah, so wisdom. So arrogance is attributing things to oneself. Now our Prophet was the most humble of people. And he would love to sit with the misakin, the down and outs, the downtrodden of society. And it wasn't kind of like, let me do my empathy practice for today. You know, people have this really warped idea of empathy and it's, it's, it's far closer to like this self-gratification kind of, I've developed empathy. 
I can feel sorry for people. Barakallahu feek. How is that helping them? You know, now because you've 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 detuned out of that worldview where you're so self self obsessed that you know if somebody is like homeless or somebody's in need, let me feel empathy for you because that makes me feel good about myself. The real empathy has no place in the self at all. It's connected to the ruh. Because what it does is it drives you into action. Okay, now how can I serve this person? How, what can I do? Because there is a responsibility now in being shown this reality. How can I serve this person? How can I help them? Whatever way I can do. That's the hal of a believer. You don't even see yourself, you know. Like modern trends of, you know, gratitude. It's just, I'm such a good person because I'm, I show gratitude. How do you know you're not being taken into account? The sign that something is being accepted by Allah, something is dear to Allah, and you're truly increasing in consciousness, you're truly on an authentic spiritual path, is you become far, far less aware of your own self. You become acutely aware of those things, but it's objectified. And you start to look, when you look at those flowers growing within your soul, those things blossoming and blooming, who was the one that caused that to happen? You're just tending to the garden. You make a flower grow. You can bring it, you know, out of its, out of its, you know, out of the bud. Only Allah can cause it to grow. All you can do is irrigate and tend to that, that, that garden bed. So also arrogance, a sign of arrogance is to turn away from truth. Turn away from truth. And an example of that, the scholars give, is when somebody tells you something that's real and it may pinch and it may hurt, it may be bitter, yeah, but you can't take it. And one of the signs, that, like a because the nefs has all the defense mechanisms going, it starts to project itself on you. So it's like a, the first line of self-defense, it's like, okay, let me put this back on you. It's like in the playground, people, I know you are, you said you are, so what am I? It's like that, it's like, what? But you're like 40 years old, bro. Like, grow up. You know what I mean? You're like 50, like 60, and you're still on playground rules. You know, if somebody says that to you, say, for an example, as an example, if somebody is younger, younger than you, a kid, your own kid, whoever, yeah, comes up to you and says, you're like this. Yeah? And the response is, but you're just a kid. The scholars say, but... Was it true? <laughs> you know, who cares if he's, you know, a toddler or a, you know, a pensioner? Is it true? Was what they said real? Why did it pinch your nerve? Why did it uh, unsettle it? Why, why go into, if it, you know? So you've got to look at the, the truth of what's being spoken and not the one that's saying it. Who are these kids to speak to their elders in these days? Back in the great, the heyday of the Ummah, you know, you'd never get such bad adab. Okay, Barakallahu fiqh. Back in the heyday of the Ummah, you'd never get such a, like, you know, an exceptional nafs. You know, they're just taking after you. You know. That's the thing, if we were at where we should be, then people around us would start to acclimatize. La ilaha illallah. And one of the signs of um, arrogance is you have this expectation that people, of people to, to serve you. They should be serving me. Why are they not serving me? Why am I not treated, you know, in the way that I deserve? All of these things, it's all a sign of arrogance. To that, many, the Salaf would actually say that um, it was said that uh, a person that car carries their shopping back from the market, back from the souk, so back from the supermarket, bari min al kibr, it's free from arrogance. And that's why, as a spiritual practice, many of the great spiritual masters of the, of the, the path of Ihsan, they would make it an active thing that they were the ones that would carry the bags back home. You know. Oh, the kids will do it. No, we'll just, no, 
there's, there's a secret in that that's unlocked just by carrying your bags back home. You know? Also to force oneself to serve other people. If you find something in the nafs, yeah, but I don't really want to do that. They can serve themselves. They can sort themselves out. Or like, if, what are you going to lose? Because a lot of arrogance relates to like, if I serve them, they've got one over me. But it's between you and Allah. Who cares? If, it's, if it was really between you and them, if they were the ones taking you into account, you know, ha ha, so you got, got one over you, that's not what it's like. Once again, it's a sign of sickness. It's a sign that the heart's been distorted. You're not seeing reality. It truly is. Who cares? Allah's the one that's watching. Allah's the one that's taking things into account. وَمَنْ تَوَادَعَ لِلَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ The one that humbles themselves before God, Allah raises them. And that's, the, that's a sign of a sincere aspirant. A true Muslim. Really. And that's why it requires so much courage. It's not an easy thing to do. You know? Well, give us tawfiq, inshallah. So to have a wird of some kind of service, some kind of khidmah. Sayyid al qawm khadimahum, the master of a peoples is their khadim. Why? Because it's so indicative of this reality of, of humility and, and beauty within the heart. SubhanAllah. So every time in our day, we have got to think of what did I do one thing to serve someone else? And that if you really want to, because you have novice, which is just, you know, just getting that thing out of the way. And then you have like an advanced level, someone that's serve, you're serving someone that it's really difficult for you to serve. It's really pinching the nerves. Uh, and they're just loving it. They're relishing in it. And I'm just like, there you go. And they've pro probably got all sorts of prejudices towards me and they're, hating on me and they probably think this and that. Okay, tell them. That which is heavier upon the nafs is heavier upon the scales, Yom Qiyamah. So where do you want to be? Your choice. Spirituality is inherently empowering. It's your choice. Where do you want to go? What do you want to take? You know? Yeah. So what, what spiritual practices can we be inculcating within our lives as of today? To maintain, hopefully, a humility. You know, and to listen to people. You know, to speak over people. The Prophet system would never speak over people. Never interrupt. Sign of arrogance is just to be completely disparaging of everyone else's opinion. Basically, you're on top of the pyramid. Well, we know who is pretty good at building the pyramids. And that's the menhaj. We don't want to be on that. You know. And the reality of the hierarchy, you know, is it's with Allah. Allah is the one that raises people. He's the Rafi and the Khafu. He's the one rises, the one that raises people and the one that obeys his people. So set your sights on him. You know. Allah raises uh, those who believe and those that were given knowledge in degrees. But none of us know. None of us know someone else's reality. And the, the, the hell of the believer is that anyone that we see, we should think that this person, even if it doesn't seem like they're doing anything exceptional, maybe they do something that I don't know about. Maybe they're doing something that is so dear to Allah, they're walking around and Allah's already forgiven all of their sins. And you're scratching your head in your Muqiyamah. Okay, how did that happen? According to my rulings and my recordings, and that's another thing. Like Allah never sent you, as the, you know, to help out the malaika. They can do a good job themselves. Well, you know, have you seen he did this? Don't worry, it's taken care of. Where are you at? And Yom Qiyamah, the address is to you. Not to, well, this guy, have you seen where he was at? You. And the people of Allah are the ones that understand that address whilst in this world. And to that means they say the one that is in more of a state of muhasaba, they take themselves into account, they redress the wrong, they're in this state of constantly detoxing from what's not real and realigning themselves, constantly checking themselves yeah. to improve. Yeah. That their muhasaba 
is less on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Their, their account, the, the being accounting, you know, that process of accountability is lightened for them on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And a person that does not engage in this, in this reality whilst in the world, you know, they just, they don't really pay much attention. Then it's more intense for them on Yom Al-Qiyamah. They're really taken into account. Why did you do this? Why did you, why did you do this? You didn't take care of yourself in the dunya. Let's take care of things now. Why, did, why were you that way to, why do you behave that way to that person? You know, and you just thought there was something flippant and you just ignored it whilst in the dunya. Okay, now it's taken care of now. Whereas the other thing, ah, I did the wrong thing. That was a bit arrogant. I shouldn't have done that. Let me make tawbah. Astaghfirullah. Let me punish my nafs. And punishing the nafs isn't, isn't just, you know, self-torture. It's refining it. It's saying, no, that was out of place. You know, like in tree surgery, if you're, if you're kind of, you know, cultivating a beautiful tree, then that branch is slightly out of place. We want it to grow beautifully, you know. And the nafs needs cultivating, needs, you know, taking care of constantly. May Allah free us from arrogance. You know, the one that has an atom's weight of arrogance in their heart will not enter Jannah. It's really serious. The one that has an atom's and that, that can sometimes come in many forms. Arrogance comes, comes in many forms. You know, maybe someone's not that bothered about what kind of car that they drive. Someone come, pulls up in a nice flash car. It's just not really my thing. Maybe someone's not that bothered about other things. But maybe there are other things as well, like intellectual arrogance. You know, I kinda, I'm, I'm a bit more woke than that person. I'm a bit more intelligent than that person. I'm a bit more, okay, so what? If the whole deal was about intelligence, you just get a load of Cambridge professors in Jannah and they're all the rest of creation will be you know, somewhere else. But it's, that's not the understanding of intelligence. Even your understanding of intelligence is warped. Men in Achaeus, the Prophet said, who's the one that's really intellectual? A truly intellectual person. You know. It's the one that prepares for the next life. Not the person, whatever kind of degree you've got. There are many simple Muslims that have lived throughout the, throughout the annals of time. You know. And their intelligence, their aql is far more powerful. And they may be simple grocers or you know, meat sellers or roads, whatever it may be, you know, but they're dear to Allah because they got the point. So they say, if you think you're better, this is a, an intense thing, but it's, this is the medicine of the doctors of the heart. They say, if you think you are better than anyone else, you have arrogance in your heart. And, well, I, I don't do those kind of sins. I don't do that wrong. I've, I've, I gave that up before I became Muslim, and they're still on that. I'll be there. Like, I don't do... Okay. And they say, like, the, the way to think about it is, you know that person's end, and you know your end? You know where you're going to go? You've got your ticket to Jannah? So even if you see someone in a state, literally... Sinning before you. Yeah. Do you recognize this is something which is displeasing to Allah? However, the, the, if you're going to advise a person, or, you know, it's not like, let me kick them while they're down. You're, you're wise and tactful in, the, in your approach. But the state of the heart is, this person is still better than me because I believe that they will return back to Allah. And I have hope in Allah. You know, that's my estimation of Allah, that this person will turn back. One time one of the, the, the scholars was walking and there were a group of people completely drunk. It was like a, you know, a mob of guys, just Muslims. And you know, this scholar was walking past and all of his students trying to be like dutiful murids, like stuff for Allah, look at these people. Because you know, it's a subtle thing, as in like, because it can take on the garb of religiosity. Oh, look at these. You know, stuff like this is not the way Allah likes it. Yeah, but is that what it's about? Or is it a subtle self-promotion going on there? Yeah. So the scholar, because he had insight, he turned to him and he said, Allahumma farrihahum. 
في الدنيا والآخرة. Oh, Allah grant them joy in this life and the next. And they were all like, Astaghfirullah. Have we been studying with the wrong guy? Would you, no, look what they... And he said, he said, are they going to be in a state of joy in the next life other than that they, they, make, they really turn back to Allah? So the dua is, is a real dua. And that's what we want for people. We want people to be happy. You know, some people they have this really warped thing, like you know, they want people to be unhappy. That's a really desolate state. What an empty soul. You know, the prophets they say the people of Allah, they they're like dragging people to Jannah in chains. Like just come. I know you don't want to, I know you but come. It's better for you. No, but I, we're doing everything else that we can. You know, no, you're coming. SubhanAllah. People of Rahmah and the inheritors of the Prophet. Check, check yourself from conceit and from arrogance. Patience is half of Iman, Sabr. And the patience that a person has is indicative of the state of their Iman, of their faith. And Patience or the, the state of being a patient person, being a person of him, of forbearance, um, requires training. Knowledge is through actively you know, seeking knowledge, being taught, you know, seeking knowledge. And forbearance or patience is by making yourself patient. You know. And in the nature of uh, modern society, there are many mod cons, there are many luxuries, there are many things. And when the slightest thing, as we see it, goes wrong, you know, we lose patience. So anyone can be patient when everything's going right, going the way your nafs wants it to be. But what when Allah shows that maybe he has a different plan to the way your nafs has planned out the reality of existence? What if he diverges you from something a bit different? It gives you a different scene, gives you a different flavor, gives you a different amount, gives you a different... That's not what my nafs wanted. Then how do we react? How do we interface with the divine decree? And sabr is so essential to our faith. The scholars talk about two... Um, Categories of sabr. It's sabr in acts of devotion. To, main, to be, maintain what your, your spiritual practice. That takes patience. You know, I tried it out for a few one days, you know, a few days, went into the house, you know, right foot, but then after a few days, I just couldn't really be bothered. It was just a bit irritating. Okay, then that's indicative of your state of sabr. The people of istiqama, of true steadfastness, khalas, like the sahaba. Whenever they would do something, they would commit to it. People of commitment. Muslims should be committed people, devoted people. You know, to be a devout person, you have to be devoted. You have to be consistent. You know? And if we, slip, we call ourselves into account, we say, ah, oh, just whatever. Just throw it all out. Just, you know, pick yourself up and carry on the journey. You know? And also, sabr, to be patient in abstaining from those things which are going to distract us, those things which are sinful, those things which are displeasing to Allah. It takes a lot of patience because the ego inclines towards those things. I just want to look at whatever what I want to do, look at. I want to listen to whatever I want to listen to. I want to eat whatever I want to eat. My demands, whatever suits my appetite, that's what I'm going to get. You know? So somebody that says, no, my appetite, it's, these people aren't, Inhuman, they're not malaika, but they're courageous, they're brave. They say, this is not healthy for me. It may be nice right now, but forget all eternity. Maybe even a few weeks' time, I'm going to regret this. Maybe in the morning, I'm going to regret this. You know? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that stance of absolute courage and be patient. You know? Patient in my, you know... In the calling, of the, you know, the nafs is calling me, do this, do this, do this, and you know, no. That's how you cultivate the nafs. 
If you just give it everything at once, you know, I could do some of this today. Okay, give it and take some extra. Go for it. Bismillah. You know, then it's going to come back to more. Yeah, I want this. I, I kind of want this. What about this? No, but I want that type. You didn't get it from me. Go a bit further. Spend a bit more. You know, order a bit more. And you're like, but when the nafs realizes who's boss, prepare for a rebellion, prepare for a, a revolt. Because what starts to happen, we should all be mindful of this, when a person starts to take an active spiritual path, which means what? Practically tending to the nafs day in, day out, you're going to have a revolt. The nafs is going to go, it's going to go insane. And sometimes people think, oh, man, I was better off before this whole spiritual thing. I was better off before I had this path. I was before better. No, you just weren't aware. Now you're aware. Now you're more conscious. And now your enemy also is far more aware. Wait a minute. They're not giving me everything I want to eat right now or look at right now or listen to right now. They're not allowing me to behave the way I want to behave. Who do they think? I'm going to tell them who's boss. I'm the boss. And they say typically, at the time when it's most hard, when the nafs is so like, you know, that's when it's close to death. That's when it's close to dying. And if you hold on, most people lose out. Because the shaitan is helping out as well. And the shaitan is aware. He's knowledgeable in these things. He's aware of these things. He knows, ah, we, he's close to an opening. She's close to an opening. You know, let's get them, let's ruin, let's puncture this balloon before they start sailing on upwards. Let's take the wind out of their sails. So you've got to be really mindful of these things. If you feel that the nafs is now going on overload, yeah, know, they say typically know that there's something very great just about to happen. You know, the dawn is just about to emerge, but it might get quite dark and you have to man up. You have to take on, you know, the nafs and the shaitan, you know, and whatever it takes. You know, turn to dhikr, go and whatever it may be, whatever situation you're in, go and just, you know, no, don't allow them. Because when, if they've won that battle, they're like, we're going to win the war. We're going to win the war. We got you. So when the nafs and the ego start to get confident and they're like, okay, we, uh, we had a bit of a strategy and then this person, you know, they started to come up with this new strategy. Wait a minute, spiritual path? What's what? Whoa, we don't like this. I'm eating a bit less. I'm not looking at whatever I want to be looking at. I'm not listening to whatever we want to be listening to. I'm not, doing, I'm not behaving the way that I want to behave. And it was all about me. So what's going on? Why is this happening to me? If they start to encroach on your territory, in your dominion, you know, and they strip away those faculties that you are truly empowered by Allah, you're Abdullah, and they're like, nope, you're my slave, you do as I tell you to do. If they start to win a battle here and there, they're like, ah, see, forget this spiritual path thing, it was just, it was all a garb anyway. It was just something like, and let's really try and ruin them as well. Because now they can be talking about it from a spiritual point of view. You know, I didn't attend the gathering because uh, I, I like to be in khalwa. I didn't attend the gather. I didn't, uh, you know, I, I tried to eat loads more in front of everyone just to show everyone that I'm with them. But really, I just, I'm a person of zuhud and I, I've renounced the world. But I'm hiding my true spiritual state. It's like, what are you doing? Keep it real with yourself. Keep it real, because you're kidding, no one but your own self. Allah knows the reality. Wake up and smell the coffee. Keep it real, reset, go back to square one, and focus on Allah. Seek assistance in Allah. The nafs and the shaitan can be so heavy. Now, another thing that we should be cautious of as well, because of these two enemies, the soul, is to constantly self-check, you know, for any kind of inroads of sadness you know, or anxiety or worry to know the source. The essential source of this is the shaitan. 
he loves the believer to be in a state of hazan, of sadness. Now, what typically we do if we're unaware of these enemies and their strategies, we say, I just feel a bit sad today. Okay, now you've proclaimed, you know, your, you, where you're at. You've, you've shown him your, uh, your territory. This is where we're based. Okay, now he's going to come straight for you. Great. We love it when people are sad. You know, because where we can really kick them when they're down. And the shaitan, in essence, is weak. So don't let him in. Don't let him think he's boss. You, know, you have izin from Allah, you know, to, that you are responsible for your own faculties. And he cannot get in if, he doesn't, if you don't allow him to in. So, so much of sp practical spirituality is recognizing these points of entry and nipping it in the bud, closing it off. You're not getting in there. And what happens is that a person allow those, allows those things into the nafs, then anxiety starts to, to deepen and root within the soul, and it becomes a default spiritual state. Why am I sad? I just, I'm just sad. Why? Just sad. So much of this also relates back to what we're allowing into our eyes and allowing into our ears. So a practical tip for a daily spiritual detox is to be very, very mindful of what we're consuming through social media. No wonder people are sad if you're looking through a constant stream of sadness. Like, you're not supposed to... A healthy human state is that you look at a picture which is, which is tragic. You're not supposed to feel happy or indifferent to it. The real problem is when people become desensitized. You're looking at something that previous peoples would, would weep all night were they to see such a thing. You know, We've got to be aware of these kind of things. And people say, well, I want to know what's going on in the world. I want to help keep it real. If we want to be really sincere about this path, it, we're, oh, this path doesn't transform me. This is what, what's it all about? I'm just going through the motions. Okay, let's keep it real. You know. In those endless nights, looking through the endless stream of unconsciousness on social media, how many people have you gone out and helped? How many people have you gone out and fed? How many people have you picked up on the, on the, on the streets downtown and gone to serve? How, many, how much mon of your own precious money have you given? How much of your own time have you dedicated and devoted to serving those people? How much have you developed that bravery and courage to stand up against that oppression that is causing you know, other human beings to suffer? What have you really done? <laughs> really? They used to call it armchair politics. When people used to sit back in the armchair and, you know, Redress the wrongs of the world from the comfort of your own home. Well, now people are doing it every night. No and now, here's the thing. People don't even care. It's like, oh, that's another sad thing. That's another sad thing. That's another sad thing. One of the, part of the source for our anxiety as a species right now is we f don't feel fulfilled. You are spiritually unfulfilled. Why? Because you're not living up to that which you should be doing. And you're trying to change the world and you're not taking care of the one thing that has been entrusted to you by Allah. You. You. Not the guy next to you. Not the guy over the road. Not the guy in the masjid. You know, that isn't praying right. Isn't putting his feet right. Doesn't know how to make wudu right. Not her that's not dressed right. Not him that's doing, not saying the right thing. You. You. Take care of it. Take care of you and you'll change the world. It's narrated one of the masters. He said, yesterday I was, I was clever. Real clever clogs. I know it all. Part of the you know, intoxication of youth. You know. Yesterday I was clever. So I, so I was going to change the world. But today I'm wise. Today, right now, I've, I've matured in my spiritual state. I'm wise. I get it. So I've decided to change my own self. And if we can implement this principle, day in, day out, a little goes a long way. Redressing these things. Tending to the nature of our souls. 
don't think this is an abstract thing. That's why we talked about the beginning, practical spirituality. You know, there, There's no spirituality that is impractical. If it's impractical, it's not from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you work on your soul, if you root out pride, vanity, you stop to think you're all that. How empowered are people going to be? How more selfless are people going to be? How much are they going to be serving people? You see someone, you know you have a duty now to serve that person, that human being, whatever way you can. That's caring for people. Not spending all night going to sleep you know, on, a, on a news feed and not waking up for Fajr. Well, you're not even helping your own self. The people of Allah, they, they, they weep in the night. The Prophet ﷺ was up all night weeping for us, crying, Ya Allah, please change these people's state. Ya Allah, please. Begging Allah. Begging Allah for you and for me. From, for the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. And this, it, what it breeds is this whole outlook to society. People are oh, look at these kuffar. Look at, have you given them the message? Do you know they have the message? They may be in a better state in Yawm Qiyamah than you. Ya Allah, no one ever told me. Nobody ever told me that you existed. Nobody ever told me that you sent a messenger. Nobody told me. All they did was they just cussed me out because I, I didn't know how to escape. And I, you know, I was drinking, and I was, but Allah, I didn't know. Like That was my only relief from, what, from the pain of existence. If I knew you, I'd, I'd, to turn, I'd turn to you. You have a mission, you have a duty. A mission which is rooted in humility, rooted in selflessness, rooted in doing away with the ego and putting the ruh first, the ruh, the soul, the people of, of, of ruh, of spirit, soulful people. That's the Muslim. Check your heart. Every time you meet someone, what's the state? Nice to see you again. The, the world is sick and tired of fake smiles. There is no more time. Mean it from your heart. That's what the Prophet system taught you to do. Connect it to what's real. Make an intention to spread light. From Allah, not from you. You've got no light to spread. It's like an empty, it's like a, a plug that's been snapped, you know, snipped into. No, you need to be connected to give light. And the only way to connect is constantly affirm you are nothing. You know, people are like, oh wow. No, we need to be self-confident. You, you're saying that the Messenger of Allah Jesus, taught us to be confident in ourselves, in our nafs. We don't have confidence in ourselves. You're a conduit. You're a vessel. You should be a window back to Allah. Confidence in Allah. So Allah uses you. That's why people, all this claptrap about self-confidence, seriously. Read where it comes from as well. Read the people that promoted these things. Read how vacuous and baseless it all is. And it's not that Muslims should be self-haters, you know. The woe is me. No, the point is there's no me. Get over yourself. Turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why we don't feel fulfilled is because we don't, we're not living our purpose. And the moment you, you know that Allah is using you, that you do not deserve to be used. That Allah is using you to serve people, to spread beauty. You know, whether you get recompense from the creation or not, if someone says thanks or not, you weren't expecting rec recompense from them anyway. That's when we start to feel fulfilled from the depths of your soul. Because when you're self-confident, and I want to be fulfilled, you're just expanding the nafs and you're just growing your enemy. No wonder you feel terrible. Engage. Do away with that side of you that's just killing you. You are killing you. Your nafs, yourself, the ego self is killing who you could be. Who you could be, that's the potential. The reality of the ruh. So every day we've got to tend to ourselves. We've got to tend to our egos. We've got to check every interaction. We've got to check every response. We've got to check every... And it will seem cumbersome. Cumbersome. People will be like, why is this guy taking so long to reply? You know, rather that than be speaking a whole load of nonsense, 
that is not rooted in reality because what we speak is connected to reality and what you do is connected to reality and if your if your concern is to reconnect to what's real in everything that you do you become a person of reality and your speech becomes guided your actions become guided and you yourself become a signpost back to God you become a symbol something that people look at those people that when Allah gazes upon them, Allah is remembered. Why? Because they're not distracted by you. They're not doing it for you. It's from Allah. So Allah works through them. And that light, the conduits of light. This is how, what practical, applied spiritual practice can do to a human soul. This is how it can transform you and everyone else around you. Who doesn't want this? Really? Who does not want this? why the Prophet ﷺ said, all of you will go to Jannah. It's open to you, all of you. Illa man aba, except the one that refuses. And it's almost like, the Sahaba got it's like, who's going to refuse this? You don't want to be empowered. You don't want to deal with the lower parts of your ego that are just dragging you down. You don't want to experience this beauty. Who's going to refuse? And the Prophet ﷺ said, the one that actively moves away from my sunnah, my way, that prophetic way, that graceful way, that path back into presence, back into what's real, constantly refining, constantly taking oneself to task, constantly implementing those things out of love and out of yearning and out of memory of that one وسلم, that taught us all this. How can you not love him? And this is what he came with. He taught you to be you. People are like, I don't get how you can love someone from like over 1400 years ago, different culture, because you don't know him. If you knew him, look what he's doing for you now. Think any good from these teachings yeah, is from anyone else other than him. It's all from him. Wake up and see the reality. He's teaching you. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's from him. If there's any light in this Senate, he's the source, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Illa man ada, except the one that refuse, refuses. Ya Rasulullah, who's going to refuse this? The one that turns away from my sunnah takes a different path. You know? I've got my own practice, I've got my own way, I've got my own, and I just feel more vibe on it. Okay. Indeed, they've refused. Let's not be of those people that refuse. And there's always a call, because he's always calling Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inna lil imani. Indeed, we've heard someone call summoning. To Iman, to faith. And Aminu, to believe. Oh, you who believe, believe. How do you nourish that? How do you root that? Daily practice. The small things, it's the subtle things that count. Every single person here can be transformed. Every single person can realize their potential by going back to these realities. So check your heart, check your nafs, watch your words. Watch what you are watching. Don't impair your inner sight because you're letting things in which will cloud it. Listen out to what you, what's going in. Listen. Listen. Don't block your ears. Like the people of Nuh, they just block their ears with their fingers. We can block our ears with many things. You know. Don't be that person. Be the one that follows the Prophet and implement these things. We're going to stumble, we're going to fall, most likely. Most likely. That's all part of the spiritual path. You get up again, we'll wasil as carry on the journey. May Allah give us tawfiq. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.